morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, May 4th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. UN Secretary General Gutierrez calls for an immediate end to fighting in Sudan. The Sudanese are facing a humanitarian catastrophe. The fighting needs to stop, and to stop now. Kenya's president says the East African community will not allow military rule in Sudan. Malawi's president hosts journalists amid press freedom concerns. The news media in Cameroon remains increasingly beleaguered, and the plight of global journalists is showcased at the New York Stock Exchange. As you know, the Nasdaq is one of the premier financial market showcase in the world, so for them to showcase the plight of journalists on this particular day was remarkable. And a look at how China is investing in Africa's green energy future. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez told reporters in Kenya that the fighting in Sudan needs to stop now before more people die and the conflict becomes a regional one. VOA correspondent Maria Madialo reports from Nairobi. During a visit to Kenya Wednesday, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez called on the warring parties in Sudan to put the interest of the Sudanese people first. The Sudanese are facing a humanitarian catastrophe. Hospitals destroyed, humanitarian warehouses looted, millions facing food insecurity. For that reason, he says both Sudanese generals need to put an end to the more than two weeks of fighting. The fighting needs to stop, and to stop now, before more people die and this conflict explodes into an all-out war that could affect the region for years to come. South Sudan brokered a seven-day ceasefire between Sudanese Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti. There are no indication that the new ceasefire will work when previous ceasefires have seen fighting continue. Guterres told reporters the United Nations is ready to help the Sudanese people. And the emergency relief coordinator, Martin Griffiths, is now in Sudan to help ensure the continued flow of humanitarian assistance. The Secretary General will attend a state dinner later Wednesday, hosted by Kenyan President William Ruto, whose leadership and other progress in the region he lacked at Wednesday's press briefing. The recent f- ceasefire in Libya, the peace agreement in Central African Republic are a cause for optimism. And I salute Kenya's leadership role in the peace processes in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The UN chief will travel to Bujumbura in Burundi later in the week to discuss peace and security in the region, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mariama Jalu, VOA News. Nairobi. Kenyan President William Ruto says regional leaders will not allow Sudan to slide into military rule. Addressing a forum on migration in Nairobi, Ruto also said he and fellow leaders of the East African community plan to hold soldiers on both sides of the conflict accountable. Despite EAC's failure to achieve a sustained ceasefire in Sudan, some analysts say the organization could help push warring generals to the table. Victoria Amunga reports from VOA's Africa News Center in Nairobi. Nearly a month since armed conflicts between rival factions of the military government of Sudan began, efforts by the international communities to broker a truce in the country have failed to hold as both parties repeatedly violated three ceasefire agreements. But leaders in East Africa say they will bar military rule in the region. Kenyan President William Ruto said Sudan had already made progress towards governance and that they will not allow what he terms as a small disagreement to destroy those gains and that the soldiers will be held accountable. They have absolutely no reason to destroy people's business, people's livelihoods, cause unnecessary chaos and mayhem when the quarrel can be solved by dialogue, by a conversation, and we are determined to stop our continent from the slide into military rule. This continent is ready and we are prepared to build our democratic institutions and to get the people of this continent to choose the government they want. Experts on international relations such as Masharia Munene say despite unsuccessfully ending conflicts in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the ESC stands a chance to convince Sudan's military to end fighting because it's in their interest as the country itself 
hopes to become an ESC member. Concerted effort is what's needed. So whoever has a, a line to Dagala or to Bana, uh, Bana then uh, use those uh, avenues to point out that it is in their interest uh, to pause, stop killing each other, to convince the leaders that they do not want to be a perpetual pariah in the region. The fighting has claimed over 400 lives and displaced more than 800,000 people since erupting on April 15th, according to the United Nations. Both military factions have defended their stand. Nick Westcott, director of the Royal African Society, sees the conflict as a chance for the East African region to move past the failures in the DRC independently and convince warring soldiers to lay down their arms. In the DRC, there is already a UN uh, force, MONUSCO, that is trying to keep the peace. And uh, the East African force is complementary to that. And its presence was agreed by the various parties involved, particularly the Kinshasa authorities. In Sudan, there's no existing authority, in effect, and no agreement on any party that there should be a third, third force coming in to assure peace, at least not at this stage. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development agreed last week to send South Sudan's President Salva Kiir, Kenya's Ruto and Ismail Omar of Djibouti to help broker a ceasefire in Sudan. Sudan's former colony hosted the peace talks and brokered the latest ceasefire, which also hasn't been held. Munene says it is in the interest of Kiir for Khartoum to end its war because of his dependence on the port for trade. Being landlocked, you know, it is the oil producing country, and the oil goes through Khartoum or the Khartoum area to the Red Sea here. Yeah? So it is, uh, South Sudan is hurting. Kiir on Tuesday said he held separate telephone conversations with Sudanese Armed Forces General Abdel Fattah al Burhan and RSS Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, both whom have agreed to send representatives to talk. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Only about half of Africa's population has access to electricity, a problem that China is seeking to address. But after leader Xi Jinping pledged in 2021 to not build any more coal plants abroad, the focus is on investment in wind and solar power. Kit Butler has the details. A wind farm in Namibia and a floating solar farm on Zimbabwe's massive Kariba Dam are among the new green energy projects in Africa that Chinese companies are looking at investing in this year. Tony Tiu, CEO of the clean energy company Renewables in Africa, is optimistic about investments from China. It is well documented that Africa has serious problems with power supply. With only 54% electrification rate and uh, at the same time the economy is growing, The continent presents significant business opportunities with high rewards. Reaching the Paris Agreement goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 takes a global effort, says Li Bian of the London School of Economics and Political Science. Collective efforts from all countries with all sources of finance are much needed to achieve the net zero transition globally and in Africa. While the U.S. is also investing in renewable energy projects in Africa, China is the world's biggest producer of solar and wind power. Chinese companies may install more renewables globally, but they're also installing more non-renewable conventional energy capacity than any other country in the world, says Corbus van Staden of the China Global South Project. Xi Jinping is working as hard to expand renewables as he is to also secure, you know, for oil flows and coal flows into China. So, you know, that, that kind of complexity has to be kept in mind. For example, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation and Total Energies, a French company, are investing in a controversial crude oil pipeline project in East Africa. Critics point to concerns about displacing people and damaging the environment, while supporters say the project will bring much-needed electricity to parts of Africa. South Africa, meanwhile, is experiencing a power crisis due to aging coal power stations and experiences daily rolling blackouts that are crippling the economy. One of the first actions by new Minister of Electricity, Kongshencho Ramagopa, was to meet last month with Chinese Ambassador Chen Xiaodong to discuss how China might help. 
China's Henan Group has plans to bring renewable energy to South Africa. Many of the latest green energy projects China has announced in Africa are relatively small investments compared with the large Belt and Road infrastructure initiatives from previous years, such as ports and railways. This is part of Beijing's shift to what she described as small is beautiful projects, which in part focus on China's so-called Green Silk Road. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. As the world marked Press Freedom Day yesterday, Wednesday, the New York Stock Exchange, Nasdaq, recognized the plight of persecuted media workers around the globe by allowing the committee to protect journalists to ring the opening bell. Liberian journalist Rodney Sear, publisher and editor-in-chief of the Front Page Africa News magazine, was one of the journalists invited to the occasion. Sear tells me there needs to be more advocacy for reporters imprisoned around the world and against laws that criminalize the profession. I'm here on the invitation of the Committee to Protect Journalists. This morning we were at the NASDAQ in New York City to ring the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange. I was joined by members of the Committee to Protect Journalists, including the President, Judy Ginsburg. It was a very nice occasion that uh, brought us all together. There were pins and apparels showcasing our fight for journalists who are in prison around the world. And so it was very, very important for us to gather at this unique location. As you know, the NASDAQ is one of the premier financial market showcase in the world. So for them to showcase the plight of journalists on this particular day was remarkable. You mentioned the plight of journalists globally. You also have experience about uh, press freedom in Liberia. Tell us what's the state of press freedom in Liberia. Well, the Liberian press is thriving under uh, immense uh, circumstances. Although the guns are silent, but there are cases where journalists are being attacked on social media, particularly on Facebook, where surrogates of government and government institutions go after journalists on social media for reporting or doing their work. And it's very difficult for anyone to work in an environment where you feel threatened. I think a lot of countries share similar sentiments. Ethiopia, you know, for example, Cameroon, where journalists are being attacked every day. And the social media angle was also discussed in a a backdrop discussion uh, also held at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Tell me about the social media aspect. What is it? Well, um, as you know, a lot of uh, government institutions who hear reporters and reportage resort to using the social media accounts under fake names and stuff to respond to stories published about government or see them as negative or against government works. So I think um, most of the journalists share the same sentiment that something needs to be done for Facebook to actually look into these things because they are bordering threats against journalists. Rodney, besides censorship for journalists, how can Africa develop the profession proficiently? I think there needs to be more advocacy from the international circles regarding journalists who are imprisoned in these countries around the world, in Africa especially. Um, There needs to be some kind of awareness about what's happening. As you know, right now, the issue in Uganda about gay rights is on the burner. Uh, That issue was brought up in the discussion we had at the panel discussion at CPJ yesterday, where we said that issues like that kind of drown other equally significant uh, issues involving journalists. And one of the issues that I think is important is the fact that the profession has been criminalized by laws and injustice within the court system. That's something that we're currently dealing with across the continent. But lots of journalists are being uh, labeled as criminals. The court system is ineffective, corrupt, and dishonest, thereby uh, leading many journalists across the continent open to a lot of negative portrayals within these government institutions. They see journalists as criminals, and it makes it difficult for journalists to do their work when surrogates and sycophants of government institutions result to social media attack on journalists. Rodney, uh, let me say happy World Press Freedom Day. Thank you, James. Rodney Sears, is the editor-in-chief and publisher of Liberia's Front Page Africa newspaper and the author of George Weir, the story of Africa's footballer president, an unauthorized biography. You are speaking with me from New York City.
Malawi's president, Lashro Chakwera, Wednesday hosted a group of reporters to a breakfast at his state residence in Lilongwe as part of World Press Freedom Day. During the event, President Chakwera assured his government's commitment to promoting the press. However, the Media Institute of Southern Africa says the administration has not lived up to its promises due to its failure to fund the Access to Information Act and the closure of several TV and radio stations last year. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. The government announced plans to implement the Access to Information Legislation, or ATI, in 2020 as the fulfillment of the campaign promise President Chakwera made during that year's presidential election. The act ensures public access to information, including for people with disabilities, linguistic minorities, and the rural poor. The UN notes that it also provides whistleblower provisions which protect the disclosure of confidential information that exposes corruption, abuse of office, and human rights violations. However, the chairperson for the Malawi branch of the Media Institute for Southern Africa, Teresa Ndanga, said during the event that the enactment of the act remains a challenge. Your Excellency, for two consecutive years, Government has not allocated resources to the Malawi Human Rights Commission for the implementation of access to information law. The campaign promise was fulfilled by your administration in operationalizing the law, but we are obviously stuck on the implementation side. Your Excellency, I'm at a loss on whether we should continue to applaud your administration on the gains registered on ATI. In response, the government says financial constraints have kept it from implementing the law. Ndanga also raised concern over the recent shutdown of four television stations and six radio stations by the government for failing to pay annual license fees, saying it eliminated jobs held by media professionals in the country. It is due to these reasons that Malawi has registered a decline in world press freedom rankings. It has dropped from position 62 in 2021 to 80 in 2023 we definitely need to get back on track your excellency let me remind you that we still have criminal defamation laws that need to be repealed and we need to do so with agency however vandanga commended the administration for its efforts to promote a free press these include promises to amend legislation that infringes on freedom of expression and the repeal of sedition laws in his speech, President Jaguera said his administration will continue to safeguard the freedom of expression and the press as enshrined in the Constitution of Malawi. My own interpretation of this is that no matter what other human rights we enjoy, we cannot promote or protect them without using our right to express ourselves freely. He believes that the freedom of expression and of the press is not just a right, but a sacred responsibility which should be taken seriously. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. Cameroon, which has a number of media outlets, appears to be fertile ground for journalism. The government claims that is proof of its support for freedom of expression. But as stakeholders contemplated the state of journalism on World Press Freedom Day, journalists decry a swelling number of constraints that many say are rendering the profession life-threatening. And Ayeke Devine has this report from Douala. Le Cameroon compte à ce jour près de 700 titres dans la presse écrite. Plus de 150 stations de radio diffusion. That's Cameroon's Minister of Communication, René Emmanuel Sal. He says the country counts 700 newspapers, 150 radio stations, nearly 100 TV channels, and a mushrooming online media. Eloquent proof of the extent of press freedom in the Central African nation. But critics say otherwise. Reporters Without Borders ranks Cameroon 118th out of 180 countries in its 2022 World Press Freedom Index. It says the country remains one of the most unsafe playgrounds for journalists worldwide. Two have been killed since January and five others are behind bars. 
Some arrested for reporting opposition demonstrations and the separatist conflict in the English-speaking regions are accused of condoning terrorism. Offenses including libel and defamation are considered penal and government censorship and threats of shutdown for those tampering with regime interests are routine. Journalist Kingsley Njoka is in for the English-speaking parts of Cameroon. Also, criticism of longtime ruler Paul B. is hardly tolerated, including broadcasts that question the president's mental state. Officials in Cameroon have suspended 10 newspaper and broadcast journalists for three months. The country's communications... Meantime, publicity, a key revenue source, is fast drying up as the economy shrinks. That implies irregularly paid and meager wages and generally dire working conditions. Dr. Roger Tapa is a workplace health care specialist. He says the ramifications for journalists in Cameroon are far-reaching as many cannot afford appropriate medical care. C'est le traitement salarié des, des employés qui a un problème chez nous. C'est un secret pour personne. Il faut qu'on commence à évoluer. Among those killed since January is Martinez Zogo, a critic of alleged high-profile graft. He went missing on January 17, and his mangled corpse was discovered dumped on the outskirts of the capital Yaoundé five days later. As 89-year-old President Bia progressively retreats from public view, some envisaging a potentially chaotic succession fear that power mongers appear bent on silencing critics, including especially journalists. Reporting for VOA from Douala in Cameroon, I am Tariq Edivan Jr. The CEO of Freedom House, Mike Ibramowitz, says the world has been in a sort of democracy recession, which means that more countries over the past 17 years have seen declines in political rights and civil liberties than improvement. He shares with Carol Castillo, the host of VOA's press conference USA and Encounter radio programs, an overview of the status of freedom in Africa. Africa is a super important continent. And I would say the picture for freedom for democracy has been mixed in Africa, specifically in 2022, freedom advanced slightly in Africa with 11 countries seeing improvements in political rights and civil liberties and nine having declines. You know, the biggest decline was in Burkina Faso, which, of course, had two successive coups and dropped 23 points, which is a huge amount in our overall scores. Kenya was a better story. It gained four points after one of its most transparent presidential elections ever. So I think those two cases point to the kind of differing trends across the region. And I think the two countries that I would also just want to mention would be Sudan and Ethiopia, really two of the largest and most influential countries on the region. And both really had been very hopeful situations several years ago. You had in Sudan a coup that deposed the leader of Sudan, and then you had a kind of a, a liberalization, an opening in Ethiopia with Prime Minister Abiy coming to power. But there's been great disappointment in both countries, particularly in Sudan. Well, I'd say both countries, really, but Sudan seems to be reverting, sadly, to the kind of military dictatorship that has kind of dominated the country since its independence and very violent. Uh, there's a big threat of violence. And there's really, you know, Ethiopia has become one of the most violent. You know, the, the situation in Tigray is one of the most dangerous in the world from the point of view of ethnic killing, which is something that we've seen around the world heightened in Freedom House. But that's so we're quite concerned about trends both in Ethiopia and in Sudan. And I think, as you suggest, great powers, you know, like China, Russia, are looking to wield more influence in the region. Mike Ibramowitz is the CEO of Freedom House. He spoke with viewers Carol Castillo. I am James Botte in Washington saying, have a great